Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for our virtual workshop um, on chemistry, resources for virtually teaching the mole concept. I'm Angie with Vernier and I will be working along with my colleagues, Noos Hissam and M Melissa Hill. Um, they'll be the chemistry ex experts and answering your questions. Um, I did uh, right now, I'm putting the handouts um, if you didn't have a chance to download them before the workshop, the link to the shared folder uh, is in the chat uh, box. Um, we're going to ask that you use the Q&A feature on the control panel to um, ask your questions. Melissa is going to be helping to field questions um, and Noose can help answer those along the way during the webinar. Um, just let you know, if we happen to not get to your question, we will follow up with you after uh, our workshop today. And just to let everybody know that this is being recorded and will be available on our website after today. So I would like to introduce Noos and Melissa. Hi. Melissa, you want to go first? Sure, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Melissa Hill. I'm one of the chemistry staff scientists at um, Vernier. Uh, so I do a lot of work with these types of trainings, um, for customers. I also do product development and curriculum development and uh, software development and I've been at the company for about 10 years now. So I'm um, and I'm really excited to be here and help with this virtual workshop. This is our first chemistry virtual workshop this this year so um, I'm excited. Sounds good. <laughs> Hi, my name is New Sissom. I'm a former uh, chemistry and physics teacher uh, from Maryland. I taught uh, chemistry and physics for 34 years. Um, I've used uh, Vernier equipment since 1984, and so I've been using David's uh, equipment in my classrooms for a long time. Um, in, in 2016, they needed an, another chemist in the office, and they offered me a position. And so for the last uh, little over four years, I've been at the office um, uh, helping with uh, curriculum development, workshops. Uh, those are my, my big um, areas in chemistry. Um, and I'm also excited to work on some new ideas, which we'll, I'll share as we go along. Uh, one thing I want, we did want to mention is we have a number of remote solutions available on our website and actually the activity we're going to do today is also uh, available in here. So if you go to Vernier.com um, and you click on the remote solutions option here, we have a number of things available and, and today what I wanted to, to focus on is the free stuff because we do, we have things that are, that are not free, you know, there's like pivot and things like that that, that, that teachers are finding very, very useful for working at home, but you, you, you can pick any one of these areas and then when you go in a little further, you'll see the different things that we have uh, available to teachers. And the one I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of it, when I do trainings, I find lots of people don't realize that, that we have this, is our free data library right here at the bottom left. Uh, this is data for many, many of the experiments in our lab manuals. So if you go into this, this uh, Google sheet that we created, you can find data for every experiment. Not, I, I should, but didn't, shouldn't have said that, not every experiment, but for a lot. So in chemistry, since we're focusing on chemistry, here's the molar vo volume experiment that we're going to do. And you're more than welcome to use uh, that that um, uh, data and also the instructions. So this is available to everybody, it's free. Um, if you need a little more information about it, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, but uh, that, that uh, file of all that data is right here and, and, and many topic areas. So if you, have, if you have teachers in your school that are biology teachers or physics teachers, we have that available to, to you too. So, then the, then the question came up, and we were, we were planning this for probably a couple of months. Like, we'd like to do some workshops because normally we go around the country and we do workshops. And so, you know, the question was, well, what can we do for teachers that 
you know, will teach various concepts that come up in their courses. And we're thinking about the mole concept. And, and, you know, we don't have a lot of experiments in our lab manuals that are like convert grams to moles or convert, you know, moles to molecules and things like that. But we do have a number of experiments that involve calculations, of, including the mole and molar volume of a gas. This is one that for students, you know, how can different gases all have the same volume if they and have the same number of molecules what's that all about and you know what where is that 22.4 number where did that come from and you know that kind of thing so this is a classic experiment many of you may have already done this uh, I, you know this was the one you know you took a little piece of magnesium and you tied it to a piece of bread and you stuck it in the udiometer that had hcl at the bottom and then you put in water and you turn the thing upside down it's very similar to that that's that's the experiment uh, so yeah, this one that I, yeah, it, it, you know, it has a lot of applications. Right now, we're not expecting in the early part of your course that you've taught chemical reactions, single replacement or whatever, but you, you certainly have taught states of matter and that sort of thing. And we've got a solid and we've got aqueous solutions and we have a gas, you know, so there's all kinds of stuff going on here. This is the basic setup. Um, and Melissa made a wonderful video we're about to watch and we're giving it to you too, so you can have it. Um, but this is the basic setup. What you're going to do is you're going to capture the gas in this in this uh, flask, and then you're going to measure the pressure and the temperature of the gas. The first thing that the students need to do, though, is they need to know what the volume of the flask is. I mean, it, it's like you, you, we're, we're suggesting that you use a 125 milliliter flask. And so um, here's one right here. I have that. This is you're in my home laboratory, by the way, just in case you, you're curious what's going on. Uh, this is a, a, this is an e flask that, you know, similar to the one that you would use for this experiment. And shoot, Mr. Ism, it says 125 milliliters. Isn't that the volume of this flask? And so, you know, convince the students what you might do is take 125 milliliters of water, you know, and pour it in there and you go, oh, look, it doesn't fill the whole flask up. You know, how are we going, the gas will fill up the whole flask, you know, so how are you going to no, figure out that volume? So that's something that, that the students are challenged to do in the pre-lab. So if you look at this and I took a picture of this and I annotated it and it's in that folder of stuff that you guys will get um, and I'll, I'll I, that fo I downloaded a copy to my computer that's my copy right there um, but you guys can also get this you know from the link that Angie had put up earlier and so you I tried to do this with my students Give them a little bit of a, you know, like a little red herring here, you know, wh why would you need that? You know, AP chem teachers, it's not uncommon for uh, them to, ha to, get, to have students describe an experiment and they, they have a limited amount of equipment and, you know, would you need a volumetric flask for this particular uh, determination? Probably not. Um, and so how might you do that? And so for, you know, the, one, of the, one of the methods, a method that a lot of my students would do, of course, is fill this up with water, fill up the tubing with water, um, and weigh all that stuff before and after so that you can determine the mass of, of the water. And then th that by, by extension, then that would be the volume. Of the uh, of the space inside of the tubing and also inside of of the flask. There's a little bit of of, of volume in here. You can have them account for that even if you, if you want to get go that far. So that's the prelab. And what we did was we did put the prelab in that folder of, of, of files that you guys can access. So this folder of files that Angie sent the link to, um, there is the picture. I took a picture of this some time ago and uh, annotated it. And you might want to, you know, you might want to do something a little different. You might want to throw a ruler in there or maybe a vernier caliper. Mm, that would be, be tremendously amusing. I mean, you know, for students, they, what the heck is that thing? But anyway, let's get back to the experiment, okay? So what the students are going to do, and you'll, you can supply this, this instructions, and you know, if you're working, uh, I, didn't, I don't remember what the determination was with how much lab time uh, you guys might be actually going into, because you could do this lab, of course. That's, why, that's the way we designed it. But what if you can't? 
what if you're in a situation where it's just not possible for your students to actually do this? So what we did was we, Melissa took a fantastic video of the experiment. And so this is the video, and this is in that folder that uh, we're encouraging you to, to look at. And uh, so the other thing we did is we also collected data to go along with this video. So let me, let me just, I'm just gonna start the video very quickly here so you get a, get a feel for it. And then we're going to look at the data. So there is the, vol the, the volume of the flask from the mass, uh, and here's the video. But I wanna hold that for just a sec. And what I want to do is I want to look at the data in addition to the video. Let's kind of make this as realistic as possible, because in the, in the classroom, that's what the students would do. They would have the equipment set up and they would be collecting data. So let's do that. Um, in that same folder that um, Angie gave you the link to is a data file. Graphical analysis data files, this is our free software that, that we offer. Um, all of them end in the four letters AMBL. That's a graphical analysis file. And you'll need to download this file onto your device if you haven't done that already. So if you're in that shared folder, you'll need to download that file. So make sure if you wanna, if you wanna follow along, that's fine. You're welcome to watch me do it. But if you wanna do it yourself, download the file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open that file so we can look at the data while the experiment is progressing in the video. So I'm going to open graphical analysis. And this is the, the process you use anytime you analyze data in graphical analysis. You open the app. And then once the app is open, you use the choose file option if you have a file you've already collected and you just want to analyze it. So I'm going to click on choose file and it's going to take me to a place where I can find that file. So I had already test set this up earlier. So, you know, it looks a little bit suspicious that it went right there, but you would have to navigate to wherever, maybe your downloads folder or something like that. If you're teaching your class, remotely, then maybe you put this in a Google Drive or a Canvas uh, area or Schoology or something like that. So there's the file of data. I'm going to open that up. And so you guys can kind of follow along. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tile my screen so that you can see, I can get the, get the, uh, um, There we go, graphical analysis over there. Let's get the video. Where'd my video run off to? Here it is. And so let's let's take a look at this from the beginning um, like a student would do. So let's go back and I'll start this over again. So if you remember that, especially if you've taught this uh, for as long as I have, you take a little piece of magnesium and this is there's the melissa determined that the the mass of all the water in the flask was 151 we're going to need that later on you you would mass out a piece a little itty bitty piece of magnesium and so students will need to know that value because from that they will be able to calculate the moles this reaction if you're not familiar with it is a, a limiting, rea lim limiting reactant reaction where you're using an excess of, of hydrochloric acid. So you're gonna consume all of the piece of magnesium. And so what's gonna happen is we have the mass of magnesium. This is a picture of the equipment that um, you're going to be using. Um, you're getting a little behind the scenes view of the, the Vernier chemistry lab uh, right now. Melissa put the piece of magnesium in the flask. And so she's putting it in a water bath so that we can get a constant temperature. And she's um, to clamping it to the stand. That that's this is one of our Vernier um, uh, stir stations, which is tremendously handy in a, in a chemistry lab. Um, and there's a, a go direct temperature probe. She's putting that in. The black thing she's putting that in is called an electrode support. And so that's getting, getting put into the water bath. We had a lot of teachers when we donated, when we were giving this data away that were concerned that their students couldn't follow, you know, what's going on. So here, what Melissa is doing is she's following the procedure that that file we looked at earlier, step by step. So if the students are reading along, they can, this is as if they were doing it themselves. She's trapped the air into the into the flask and now she's going to get some one molar HCl. There is a typo 
um, in the in the procedure that I have in the process of repairing, but we haven't done it yet, where it says three molar. It's actually uh, five milliliters of one molar is still an excess of hydrochloric acid, so it will that, and it's a little safer. So that's why we switched that over. So what she's going to do now is she's going to get this all lined up, ready to go, and then what she's going to do is going to start collecting data. So they, now the data is starting. So if you have your graphical analysis file open, we are right here in the file. We're, I just tapped on graphical analysis, and we're a few seconds in. What Melissa just did is she injected the uh, HCl into the flask, and then to account for that extra, you know, the volume of, it, of the five milliliters of HCl, she pulled the syringe back, and so the, the pressure dropped again. But we had that initial pressure here, so we know what the initial pressure of the um, the air was in there, because now we're adding hydrogen to that. So now that change in pressure is going to be as a result of the hydrogen and a small amount as a result of the temperature, which of course we're gonna to have to account for when we do the calculations. One side note, um, Jack Randall, who wrote this, the lab manual, he, he and I have talked about this, and uh, there is a way to do this without a syringe. And so if you are curious about how to eliminate this bump right here and do this without a syringe, Send me an email at chemistry at and I can I can walk you through it. I don't want to do it now because it's you know it, I don't want to uh, take time out of this because this is the procedure that is in the handout. But it is possible to do it even without the syringe. So what's happening now? We are some, somewhat along in the data collection. We know that the magnesium is is um, decompose well, not decomposing. It's reacting right with the HCl. So the pressure is increasing as the hydrogen gas is is um, going into going into the flask, and so uh, it's a little bit like watching paint paint dry at this point. You know, there's the little you would notice the little piece of magnesium is disappearing. The the uh, hey, hydrogen man. gas. Go ahead. Yeah, we we got a question about, um, and I thought this might be a good time to uh, talk about it. With this particular experiment and other experiments that Vernier has, how could you use this to talk about states of matter? Oh, sure. Well, th this one certainly lent itself perfectly, right? Um, because we have a solid, we have, um, well, in the old days with the udiometer, you had a liquid because you had water, and then we have a solution of hydrochloric acid, and then we have a gas. So um, I always, always required my students to, um, to, to put the states of matter into their, their balanced equations that was required. So this one shows a lot of those. There's a, we have a number of experiments. We have a phase change experiment in which the students um, you look at the freezing and melting of water. Um, there used to be one in, in, in the AP Chem, in the advanced book that also looked at um, um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, butanol, uh, tersh butanol. Um, and so we do have a number of experiments that they don't explicitly just teach phases of matter, but they teach some concept related to it, like why you know, is the is the freezing point and melting point constant during the during the phase change, uh, the uh, phase change. Um, so yeah, we do have we do address it in different ways in different parts um, of the experiment. This is trial two. I think you guys get the idea. I don't know that I need to, we need to watch this again. Although if you'll notice at the beginning of trial two, Melissa did put in, look, like here's the, the, the balance again. So, the, so there's, it ended tri trial one. Tri here's uh, her weighing out the, um, the, the uh, piece of magnesium for trial two. There's, you know, students can get that from the balance. Oh, what if they didn't look carefully at the balance? All right, we are now, on to um, analyzing our data, okay? And so one of the features, I'm gonna get rid of this video because you guys can download it and you can see the rest of it. It's just, a, we, she, we did all three trials. Since the experiment calls for three trials, Melissa did it three times diligently, you know, so you'd have good video to share with your students. But let me go ahead and um, get rid of that because we don't need it. And let's go to the um, data. I think I'm going to go stop this right here so it's not running in the background. So here is the data from trial one. Where's trial two? Where's trial three? If you tap on the y-axis label, there is trial one, two, and three. And Melissa put, you can rename 
these runs. And so these three little dots allow you to do that in graphical analysis. So Melissa put the masses of the little pieces of magnesium right there so that your students would have it and you would have it. So they can get it from the video, they can get it from here too. So what else are you gonna need to know? So if we go back and look at, let me minimize this here a little bit so we can be bouncing around a little. So if we go back and look at the analysis, so the video will help your students walk through, you know, what is going on? How does this data get collected? What do they mean by all these steps in here? You can see those explicitly in the, in the video. But then what about the analysis? How do I get all this stuff? Well, that's now that at that point, they need to think about, well, where am I gonna get the mass of magnesium? Oh, that was in the video. That was also in the graphical analysis file. What about the volume of the flask? Well, Melissa gave us the mass of water that filled up the flask and the tubing. And so if we assume that the density of water is one, under most conditions, that'll be good enough, particularly for this experiment, then that'll be the volume. What about the maximum pressure? So let's go back and look at graphical analysis, and you're welcome to follow along with me on your own computer, or you can watch me do it. There's a couple of things that I'd like to share with teachers when you're using graphical analysis. One is, and when you're particularly when you're teaching and doing a presentation, these three little dots, top left, top right corner, and the presentation mode. Oh my gosh, this when we do presentations, I love this because I can zoom this up to make it easier for folks to follow, particularly in a room where I'm projecting up on a wall, but even during a during a virtual workshop. So I want to know the the mac according to the to the analysis, I need to know the maximum pressure. So I one way to do it is to just simply move this around. When you click on a, on the graph, let me clean that off. When you click on the graph, it goes right in what we call examine mode. And so we're in examine mode. We can just move around and find the the, the largest value. Little rhetorical question. What, isn't there a more glamorous way to do that? Well, of course, all of our software has this built in. Bottom left corner, this little graph tools icon, we can go to statistics. And when we do that, since I didn't select anything in the graph, it did the whole graph. So it's we're looking now at the statistics for the whole 600 second run. There's the, the mean value, the minimum value, the maximum value, the change, okay, which is something that might be helpful. Um, it is possible in graphical analysis to select just a piece of the graph and look at the statistics if you want. You can just highlight the piece of the graph you might wanna focus on. If you then do the statistics on that piece that I selected, then it will only look at that uh, from 11 seconds to 225 seconds. So it kind of depends on what you're after here in terms of um, in terms of you know what what the experiment means. Notice that Melissa had turned on a temperature probe to get the temperature of the water. Notice up here we have the temperature water was pretty constant over the course of the experiment. Maybe what you might want for the analysis is you just might want to turn on the statistics and look at the mean value for that one, right? Is just get the mean temperature. So let's go look at, at the uh, data table, what we've got so far. We've got the volume of the water was 151 for trial one. The maximum pressure, we can get that from our statistics. The initial pressure, once again, we can get that from this. From this. We gotta be careful because if we do statistics on the whole data set, did you notice when Melissa pulled the, the syringe back, we had a little bit of a drop here? You know, Students will make the same mistake. If we wanted the initial pressure and we told graphical analysis to do statistics and we took the minimum pressure, that eh, may not be what we're after here. So, so we may have to do a little bit of adjusting there. Um, and then uh, the change in pressure and then the temperature in Kelvin. So, you know, we can get the mean value. Now, what I did was uh, so so that we could kind of, let's, let's check Melissa's work here and see how good she did. Uh, I actually used to use one of these all the time in my classroom. Uh, students would ask me, Mr. Hayes, am I, am I doing it right? And I would, uh, I would make a spreadsheet, uh, you know, back in the Excel days or whatever, but now with Google, it's even easier. In this uh, file that says, um, various files that we're providing to you, um, there is a link to a Google calculation spreadsheet. I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily give this to the students, although 
they have to spend a little bit of time and uh, looking up, um, you know, stuff in here. But this is more for you. You know, it, you can quickly put the students' data in here. I, I set it to make to, so everyone can get a copy of it, and that way you're not you're not uh, messing up my original. Um, and so what happens with this is when it when Google gets done doing its thing here is um, we can put in some numbers here and let's see how it works. So this is available to you. You're welcome to uh, use it or not, uh, however it works with you. So in that first trial, let's see, I think it was 0.016, if I remember correctly. I think Google is still kind of thinking here because it's, there we go, 0.016. There we go. And then the volume of the flask and the tubing, Melissa determined 151 grams. So we're going to call use that. Our initial pressure. So this is where in, in graphical analysis, we would need to look at way over here at the beginning. What was the pressure of the air that was in there at the beginning? So that was 101.2 kPa, real close to atmospheric pressure here near Portland. There we go. Maximum pressure, this would be, you know, the, the point of, remember that we're adding hydrogen to the flask, so the pressure is going up. So we could do our, use our statistic value for that since the maximum is going to be in here somewhere. Um, so that looks like 111.98. And then our temperature in, in Celsius, uh, it is possible with our sensors to change the unit that the sensor measures temperature in, but it, you know, think about it, you know, I used an awful lot of glass thermometers in my, in my time, and so I would want the students to learn to change Celsius to Kelvin. So 28.42 degrees Celsius, let's put that in. And then everything else should be automatic. So down here, everything in red, it should be calculating. Oh, Melissa, well done. I would give this student an A. <laughs> so there we go, 1.3% error. I mean, I would be super happy with my students um, getting you know, this kind of this kind of result. And I've got the sheet set up. You're welcome to use it or not, but they're all three trials are there in the video, and they're of course they're in the graphical analysis file, just tap on the y-axis. Same applies to the temperature for the other trials. So if you want to see the temperature change for trial or see the temperature for trial two, turn off trial one and then turn on trial two. And now the graph up here is showing the temperature for trial two. Same thing here, we would just turn off trial one and turn on trial two. So a little bit of a skill thing when you're using graphical analysis of knowing you know how to do that. Lots of other things in graphical analysis you don't need for this experiment, but if you're going to use this software, you might want to explore this box up here that has all these different settings that you can fiddle with. Uh, also, bottom left corner, the graph tools icon. There's all kinds of legends and interpolations and things you can do. Um, so, before I plow on to something else, is there any questions? about anything that um, I'm going to uh, give that to. I'm not paying real close attention to the questions field, but I wanted to see if anyone has any questions or comments about this or anything else um, that we have talked about so far or haven't talked about yet. Yeah, no questions have come in yet. Any additional okay. ones other than the one I already mentioned, but feel free to put them in that Q&A, please. Has anyone done happen. this experiment? Anyone in there, you, you're welcome to um, let us know. Um, talk about how you can uh, view the video. Sure, sure. So um, the Google, Google is the best way to do it. It's free and it runs on everything. So you don't need QuickTime. I'm on a Mac, so I use QuickTime because it's really handy. It's right there. But that folder that, that uh, Angie sent you, this folder here, um, you can double click the video right there in the, in, in the, in, um, uh, Google and you can watch the video right from there. And so for a lot of kids, especially if they're on a uh, Chromebooks, this might be the way to do it is to just have this on here. I learned something cool about Chromebooks just recently 
that you can do the tiling I was doing on a Chromebook. You can have the video on one side and graphical analysis on the other side. It's um, Alt and the brackets key, the, the, the um, square brackets key. And the left one give, will tile it on the left and the right one will tile it on the right. I'm not on a Chromebook, so I can't show you that. But you could do that. You could have graphical analysis and this running simultaneously, even on a Chromebook. It can be done on, on Windows. You have to do a little bit of sliding to, to get it to tile. Uh, but yeah, use your, use, uh, it, it use, the easiest way is to just use it right out of that folder of resources that we provided. Um, and ev everyone could do that. What Can else? You talk a little bit more about how you, if you were still in the classroom and, and teaching in this world, how would you um, engage students with this? Would you have them do the video and graph at, at different times, have them watch it ahead of time, show the whole class? Do you have some thoughts on that? I do, because um, I've thought about you guys. I've, I've, I have to say in, in the three plus decades that I taught, never had to do this. So, so, but I have thought about it, you know, like how would you get kids excited about something like this? Um, ideally, you know, we'd, I would love to be able to do something live with the kids, but what if you can't do that? Or, you know, it's that synchronous versus asynchronous. I would watch the video first. I would just let the students watch the video and observe maybe with a little bit of, of, um, a discussion of, you know, pay attention to things in the video uh, that pop up like data and things like that. Watch that first. Then I would have the students read over the experiment. Now, it gives away the pre-lab a little bit, but they, Melissa never really said why that mass was there, you know, 151 grams. Well, so, okay, fine. You know, that's the mass of, that's the mask of this flask, you know, well, this weighs 151? No, kids will believe that because they don't know. Um, and so they might have to go back and, and think about the preview, the, the pre-lab. But I think I would watch the video first. I think that way when they're reading over, you know, think about what students are going to do. You're going to give them this, this experiment file. You're going to give them um, the data. And they're going to try to answer the questions. That's what they do, right? And so the thing to do is don't give that to them first. Give them the video, watch the video. This is the video of the experiment. And then let's engage like, okay, we saw the video, now let's see how, how this is gonna work. What are we trying to figure out here? Well, what is a molar, I used to, I don't know if, if any of you have it, I used to have an ACS beach ball, right? A 22.4 uh, uh, liter beach ball. You know, what is that? What is that number? Why is that special? You know, and, you, and so how can we determine that number, but that would be the way I would do it. I would probably try to engage them in the activity as much as possible uh, beforehand. Um, uh, what I would not do, okay, if anyone is even thinking about this, is I would not light the hydrogen on fire, okay? Uh, I did have some younger teachers who wanted to do that, and one younger teacher who blew up, blew up an er Erdelmeyer flask. So I would not even mention that that's a possibility. Um, if the students brought it up, I might talk about safety. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, that kind of thing. It's a single replacement reaction. We're making hydrogen gas. We did that with zinc and hydrochloric acid. Oh, look, now we're doing it with magnesium and hydrochloric acid. Um, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, do that. Are there any other questions before I show you some other things? I'm getting a lot of internet crickets here. So I'm gonna go ahead and plow on a little bit. Um, so one of the, the next things that comes up with graphical analysis is how do my students create a report? How do they send me their results? And so I want to show you what I had started to do. I, the last three years that I taught, I taught forensic science. And in fact, I'm working on a forensic chemistry vernier lab manual. Not this year. It's going to take, take us a year to get this done. Although the food chemistry book is coming out this year. Uh, Melissa and Elaine and I worked on a food chemistry book and we're, we're very close to be, being able to release that. Uh, so that's coming soon. Uh, the forensic chemistry one is a year off in, in production. But I taught forensic science for three years right at the end of, of, and what I loved about it, it was like another one of those science courses, which is a little bit of everything had chemistry and biology and physics and all kinds of stuff like that. And what I had was, I, I had no textbook 
I was, I was not allowed to buy, I had no money to buy a textbook. So we had Google Classroom and what we did was we had to design everything from scratch. I mean, it was a challenge, um, maybe similar to what you guys are going through, although I was in a real room. I didn't have to do everything uh, virtually at all. Uh, but one of the things I was doing with Google Classroom was us making assignments and grading them and having to do them online. And so one of the things I did was I thought about how can my students uh, give me a lab report um, online? And, and yet if they're a ninth grade class or a, a younger student, how can I guide them to giving me a good quality lab report? My AP kids, my advanced kids, they could, they could come up with this, what you're seeing on the screen right now on their own. But how, what about the younger kids that have, that have not maybe written too many lab reports? So this is a template I put in the uh, folder, in the file here that, that we gave you of uh, different things. It's this one that says lab report template. Take it with a grain of salt. You may or may not be interested. I have had some teachers show interest. Students would go in, you put this up like I did, you would put it up and force the students to make a copy. Google that, it's all over the web how you make Google force it, force a copy, it's really easy. And then what they do is they have to go in and fill things out, but let's get to the meat and potatoes here. I, I want my students to take my graphical analysis data and I want them to give it to me after they have analyzed it. How do I do that? So. You know, they have the usual, the usual suspects, right? Title, you know, procedure, uh, you know, method, you know, what is it that you, the equipment you need, the method, you know, what steps do you follow? I just threw some junk in there just to have something to fill it out. But what about this, you know, data and graphs? So this is kind of brilliant the way it works. I think it's brilliant. Sorry, I shouldn't be too presumptuous, but you know, how graphical analysis does this. Students can manipulate this many different ways. So, you know, if this is the data for trial one, then what they can do is they can, they can, they can put a title on here and say, you know, this is trial one. Okay, and then they can also do things like turn the statistics on and leave that turned on. You know, so I can, they can demonstrate to me how they, the, the reason it looks a little funky here is I'm zoomed up. Let me zoom down just a hair bit here. Um, it'll look a little bit better. And so they can have this turned on and then when they get it the way they want, they can do all kinds of things. Like they can, they can put an annotation in so a student can write in here and say uh, syringe pressed in, right? And so they can bring this over and stick it right there. Whatever you want, right? And up here, they can do the same thing with the temperature or turn it off. I mean, the temperature is not very exciting. Maybe you just want the graph to show all of the trials. The temperatures are not super exciting. So I could turn off and just have one graph instead of two and then just have my, you know, my, my uh, pressure graph, not my temperature graph because it's not that exciting. And then all those same things I was talking about, you know, they can, they can, they can, um, annotate it and adjust it, they can adjust the axes, all those sorts of things. But let, let's say that once you the students have it the way they need it to be, so you know maybe they have all three trials showing, right? And they can also annotate, they, pardon me, they can um, turn on a legend so we can tell which trial is which. I mean, all kinds of pretty things that they can do uh, to make this look a little bit nicer. But now, okay, I want, they need to create a lab report. How do they do that? Okay, well, up under the file menu, isn't it clever how the file menu looks like a little file? <laughs> a little piece of paper with the corner flapped over. So it, this is, this, this is, first off, notice there's no print. What the heck, how am I supposed to print this out? Well, graphical analysis runs on anything. It runs on an iPad, it runs on an Android, it runs on a Chromebook, it runs on a Windows PC. Can you imagine what it takes? I mean, especially from the programming point of view of making print work on everything. So export allows you to do two things. You can take out a graph image, which we're gonna do here right now, so I'm gonna do that. You can also take out a CSV. This is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a text file, has all the data in columns, opens in Excel, opens in Google Sheets. A uh, lot, of, lot of, especially colleges like this, they wanna pull the data into Excel and have the students massage it in Excel. It'll also, the, uh, either the CSV or the graphical analysis file will open in Logger Pro. So if you're one of our, our legacy customers that's been using Logger Pro for years, you can take this into Logger Pro. 
but I just answered this question twice today. Logger Pro only runs on computers. It does not run on, on Chromebooks or iPads or anything else. So just be aware of that. I'm gonna take this image, like let's pretend this terrible thing I just created here is, my lab, is going in my lab report, and I'm going to save that file um, somewhere handy, like if the students are using Google, then they probably would put this, um, you know, in their drive somewhere. Um, and on a on a um, iPad, by the way, you have to take a screenshot. There is no uh, no image version. You just take a screenshot. But then what you do is you go into your your report and you just insert that image. So you get that, I, I put it down on my computer, but students might have it in their Google Drive. I have it on my desktop here. So I'm gonna go grab that image. There it is, the image that I just saved and bring it into my report. What I had the students doing in forensics is I had small, I, I was lucky, I had small classes. So I had maybe three or four groups per class and we did kind of a random, you had to make a presentation. So that's where the whole idea of using, um, you know, this Google uh, the tool, you know, to do this uh, came, came about because the students could very easily create a Google Slides presentation, and then they could they could if they were the group that had to uh, make the presentation, then they could easily uh, to present that to the class. So it was a, it was kind of a neat way to um, create lab reports that were electronic that they could very easily submit, and at the same time um, learn a little bit about making a presentation and standing in front of a group and justifying in the forensics case, they had to you know, show the evidence they collected and how they analyzed it and what conclusions they came to. Uh, CSIs are not supposed to solve crimes. Um, I actually had some CSIs from the police department come in and make that very clear that they are not detectives, they are lab techs. Um, um, or in many the one that came in was a PhD. Uh, but their job was not to solve a crime. But you know, the kids watch all these TV shows, and so they get this image that they, you know, they're supposed to be solving crimes. Uh, but still, it was it was a lot of fun. I very much enjoyed that, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting uh, some forensic chemistry. We have some wonderful tools now available: uh, spectroscopy tools, and and uh, 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 we have a, we have GC now that works. That's amazing. Um, and so it can do an arson, you know, analysis, which is what I'm working on. But the, so the students could, you know, make a presentation out of this very, very easily, and then share that presentation if they wanted, which was kind of a neat uh, thing to do. So any questions about any of that last 10 minutes worth of babbling that I just did? If you want any of that stuff, it's in it's in this file that is in the big the folder that we shared with you, um, that one is the lab template one. This one, this third one, our fourth one here, that's a link to graphical analysis. So if you don't have a copy of it, there's another way to get it. You can certainly get it off our website. Um, so let me let me uh, talk a little bit more about the data library. I just wanted to, I do a lot of pivot training. And pivot, if you're not familiar with it, um, is realistic data collection. You know, a lot of us use PET for years and years. Uh, Pivot's relatively new. It's been around for about three or four years. Uh, Peter uh, is a physics teacher, so he rewrote Pivot activities for physics. Um, that does cost $5 a seat, uh, so which is very reasonable when you think about how much a textbook costs. Uh, and the Pivot libraries are huge, and there's a lot of chemistry stuff. So I've been doing fair amount of training in Pivot, but what I find is that teachers don't realize that we also have some free stuff. And um, so you're not, you don't have to necessarily pay for it. And this that I showed you at the beginning, this um, data library is free. And we have it for every level, but let me show you, you know, just the, the chemistry ones. All of these that are listed on my screen, Every one of these is a folder with at least two items in there. So, you know, I just did the molar volume one. Uh, Melissa's going to be up uh, next time. Uh, next week, we have a session on spectroscopy and the electromagnetic spectrum, and she's going to be doing uh, Beer's Law. And so there's a, there's a folder with Beer's Law activities. Uh, there's, you know, all the, all the, uh, 
the things that, you know, you want to do an acid-base titration, you know, we've got the standardization experiment where you standardize the sodium hydroxide with KHP and then you do an acid-base titration. We have them for different levels. This title here is actually our books. And so this is our chemistry with Bernier, our very first lab manual ever with Bernier. There wasn't even a physics lab manual uh, before the chemistry one. The chemistry one beat the physics one. Um, so there's also an AP Chem one. So if we slide down here, there's a folder for AP Chem. Uh, I heard a couple college folks were in the, in the audience. We have the sample data for our um, organic chemistry lab manual. However, that, those experiments require Logger Pro. So if you don't own Logger Pro, you can download a free 30-day um, copy, fully functional uh, version of Logger Pro. Pretty reasonable, uh, particularly we think for colleges, uh, $249 for a site license for your department, which you can also distribute to your students. So, um, but these are all experiments from our um, organic chemistry lab manual. So it, it follows the same idea as um, what we've been going over. If you open up any one of these experiments, uh, Melissa's gonna do food dyes next week, so I'm not gonna do that one. I'm gonna do hand warmers because that's another one that is kind of one of my favorites. Um, you'll see that there is a, um, I'm trying to remember if I had one, two files in here or more, let me see, I think it's just two. And so what you'll see is there is the graphical analysis file and there is the Word document that the students, if they don't have Word, they can open it online with Google and that this, this file will also open in Google Docs. Um, so every one of those um, folders has at least a data file and the experiment instructions on how you do the experiment. Some of them have more than one data file. If, if it was not convenient to put the data in one file, we might have created uh, two files. Over here, we have some videos, not very many, and that's we're working on improving that. Um, but these videos, um, are you're welcome to them. They're coming off of YouTube in most cases. And so if you if you pick a video, let me see, I think Melissa did the hand warmers one, didn't you, Melissa? I think you did. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was you. Maybe it was, maybe it was uh, uh, Melissa shaking her head saying, no, I didn't do it. Um, you're welcome to use these videos um, with your students. Uh, it's not the same as what she did for our workshop today. It's not the detail. Um, yeah, see, it's you. <laughs> this, this, this is Melissa running the I experiment. Forgot. Yeah, it's been a <laughs> while. Done so many videos. Went, yeah. <laughs> But uh, these are, if you want to use these, because once again, we had a, teachers telling us that it was hard for their students to visualize just on the instructions how the experiment goes. And so what uh, we, these are videos that really are designed to help teachers, um, you know, basically for teachers is what we originally thought. Now with COVID, of course, a lot of teachers are using these. You can copy that link to that video and then post that. Uh, if you want to your students, um, we are more working more and more. Uh, Melissa, can I? I can talk about Graphical Analysis Pro, right? Of course, yeah. Okay, so um, we are developing a version of Graphical Analysis that actually has videos built in, and um, it's it's I personally am not as versed in it as Melissa, so I'm not going to embarrass myself too much. But what happens is that along with the uh, data file there under this menu there will be a choice that says video and what we're doing is we're including a no i don't know if we've we've even decided how many it's going to be but i know melissa has been working on a lot of videos and the videos will be able to be synchronized with the data so you saw me today kind of faking it by watching the video and kind of moving along. Uh, the Graphical Analysis Pro will allow you to automatically synchronize the data so that as the video is progressing, the data will actually follow the progression. So you'll see the data as if it was being uh, collected um, live. And so that's one of the big features of the pro version of graphical analysis. It has some other uh, features that we're looking at to improve the, the, the software. The, um, what's the difference? Why is it pro? What'll happen is you'll, you'll, when you download graphical analysis, you'll have an option. You can use it, the download, just the way it is for free. 
if you want the pro features, one of which is going to be the video synchronization option, uh, then you will have to pay a site license, uh, pardon me, a, uh, yeah, site license fee uh, for the year. Um, and I don't know that we've, ha we haven't really set that fee yet. I, I know there's been some discussion, but I have not heard exactly what the yearly cost will be. But it, uh, unlike some of the other softwares and different, that different people sell, it'll be a fee that will be one time for your whole school or department. Any number of students can use it in your school or department, um, any number of teachers. So it won't be per student or anything like that. It'll, it'll be for, for everyone to use. Um, and it's, we're looking at some other features um, in, that, in Graphical Analysis Pro, some things that are missing from Graphical Analysis that are not hugely Re requested, but there, lots of people have been asking for certain features that um, that are not in the free version of graphical analysis. And so we're going to, for most people, graph the free version for our experiments from our lab manuals, they work, they work great. But now that we're in this situation where wouldn't it be nice if we could link the graphical analysis file to a video file and be able to show all that, that's why we developed Graphical Analysis Pro to have that ability um, so that, you know, teachers mm -hmm. could show, show that. Yes. If you want me to show it for this smaller volume of a gas, um, I could do that now if you want to. I would love for you to do that. Um, do I need to do anything sharing. or do, do just, I just stop, stop sharing? sharing your screen and I'll, okay. I'll share mine. Okay. And we'll see if we can get this to work here. All right, are you seeing graphical analysis? Hey, it looks the same. <laughs> it looks the same. So um, molar volume of a gas, the one we've just been talking about is actually one of the sample experiments available. And um, so it's <laughs> it just so happens it's the first one listed here. So you just go ahead and click on the little download thing and it opens it up right away. And the video's right in here everything is already synced. So if I click on the replay button and uh, press the start button, you'll see the uh, video there and no data collection has happened yet. It's showing the setup similar to our other video that we sent out just to you guys. Um, shows the setup so the students don't miss that. They don't miss all the volumes they need and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, then we get into the actual data collection, which was that triangle you saw flash on the screen. And you can see the data uh, coming in as I'm uh, you know, moving the syringe. So you saw that that peak there was for the syringe pressure change. And then here we're trying to zoom in to show you the magnesium strip and the bubbling and all that. But that is, um, kind of a, a glimpse there into GA Pro that is, is brand new. Uh, we just announced it, releases on Friday. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions about any of that or any of the other uh, virtual teaching options we have, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, let's see. We're doing, we've got a few minutes left. So if there's anything else, and, the, and Graphical Analysis Pro has all those same features for analysis that Noose was showing earlier to do the statistics, to export as a, a graph. Um, you can also take your own videos and upload them in here. So I know a lot of teachers are already taking videos. You were working over the summer taking videos of labs and you can put your own videos in here with the data. Um, but yeah, there's lots of options in here. And what else could I show about this? Yeah, but that's how you sync it up. So you just kind of synchronize the data. You tell it where the data starts and where the video starts. And um, you have the option to show that video screen. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, I, we're, we're, I'm learning this on the fly as I watch Melissa do that. So yeah, we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to point out one, one last thing here. We do have a number of coming upcoming chemistry activities. Um, the next two are going to be dealing with the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we're going, Melissa is going to show 
um, how to do um, absorbance and transmittance um, with uh, another piece of free software. It's called Spectral Analysis. Um, and so she's going to do that in our next session. We're going to be looking at Beer's Law. We're also going to be looking at uh, experiment number one from AP Chemistry, this sports drink experiment. This is what we have a lab manual of 16 experiments. I like to call them the sweet 16 because it's the 16 that match the 16 experiments the college board recommends. Um, you're supposed to do six out of that. Um, and so Melissa is going to go over how to, how to use electromagnetic spectrum and spectroscopy to analyze uh, solutions. The following week, I'm going to do a session on emission spectra. Um, what a lot of people are not are not familiar with is is how do you use a spec, one of our spectrovis spectrophotometers to capture emission spectra um, and uh, there is a there is a way to do it that's relatively safe and um, I've only lost one fiber in my whole career and that was uh, I, I fixed that problem and I'm going to share that with you uh, and then we have some other act activities coming up and and I understand that a lot of this uh, is going to be posted on our website so we're going to have every few weeks we're going to have um, some more chemistry activities and I uh, encourage you to look for those and sign up for them and then um, it's going to follow the same process. We're going to hopefully give you some things that you can take away with you. Uh, we've all watched a number of summer webinars where your eyes glaze over as you're watching someone make a presentation. I was hoping that today with all these things that we gave you that that would be helpful for folks and that they could use them in their classroom. So last second, anybody have anything they, they would like to say? We have about a minute or less and um, if there's you, anything. Uh can't think of anything right now or think of something later, definitely just um, shoot us an email at chemistry at and uh, we'll get back to you or we also have chat on our website and you could also still call. We're all answering phones from home. So but thanks for joining us here today. It's great having you all and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future in future workshops. Bye-bye, everyone.